Welcome to the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Rosensweet, mom of three young people, peaceful parenting coach, and your cheerleader and guide on all things parenting. Each week, we'll cover the tools, strategies, and support you need to end the yelling and power struggles and encourage your kids to listen and cooperate so that you can enjoy your family time. I'm happy to say we have a great relationship with our three kids. The teen years have been easy and joyful, not because we're special unicorns, but because my kids were raised with peaceful parenting. I've also helped so many parents just like you stop struggling and enjoy their kids again. I'm excited to be here with you today and bring you the insight and information you need to make your parenting journey a little more peaceful. Let's dive into this week's conversation. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to another episode of the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. Today, we are talking with Dr. Steve Hodges, who is a pediatric urologist and the author of It's No Accident, Breakthrough Solutions to Your Child's Bedwetting, Constipation, UTIs, and Other Potty Problems. Even if you don't think you have any potty problems, this was a really interesting conversation. And I'm going to warn you, there was so much talk about poop in this poop and body parts and pee you're probably if you have a five or six year old, they think it's hilarious. But even if you don't have issues like this, you may be surprised and find it really interesting as I did about how much the conventional wisdom around these topics is wrong. And, you know, you may also have friends who have a child who has some bedwetting or accidents or pooping accidents, and you might be able to help them out because, as I said, the conventional wisdom around this is wrong. Even what doctors advise. I have found this through my work over the years with clients. I have sent numerous people to Dr. Hodge's website when they're telling me about behavior that doesn't sound like constipation, and it turns out that it is constipation. I don't know. I find it kind of fascinating. He also, at the end, talks about some best potty training practices. So if you have a younger child or you are in the midst of that, or if you're having, you know, obviously, if you're having any issues around any accidents, bedwetting, or poop problems, you're going to want to have a listen to this. I think you're going to find this a really interesting episode. So be sure to share it with anyone who you also might think it it might help. And we can be part of changing that wrong conventional wisdom about poop and pee accidents. And, And again, be warned, there's a lot of talk about poop. All right, let's meet Dr. Steve. Hi, Dr. Hodges. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. Can you just introduce yourself and tell us about who you are and what you do? Yeah, I am a pediatric urologist at Wake Forest University School of Medicine. I treat primarily either acquired or congenital problems of the urinary tract in kids. And a big chunk of my practice involves what we call bowel and bladder dysfunction or dysfunctional elimination, basically peeing poop problems with kids. So that's kind of gotten me into a lot of research about this topic, which I think is underserved and brought us together, I think. Yeah, definitely. I, I I think I found your work maybe five or six years ago, and I have referred so many people, so many clients to your website. So thank you, because you're the only person that I found that talks about this kind of hidden constipation. Um, so I thought we could start by I was just telling you before we started recording that I was talking to some clients yesterday whose child is having poop problems, and I suggested that it sounded like constipation, and they weren't quite sure they believed me, and so I said I would I would share their experience with you and you could weigh in on what it sounds like to you. So this little boy is three and a half and he'll be four in November. And the mom writes, he pees on the potty just fine. He rarely has an accident and will go to the bathroom when he has to go. He still sleeps in a diaper um, at night and for his naps and he'll wake up wet in the morning. The problem is pooping. It seems like he will hold it in and then poop a little in his underwear. We will discover he pooped in his underwear and then put him on the potty, but he says he can't go. He will do this two or three times in a row in the evening. Sometimes we'll read a book to him while he's on the potty and hopes he'll go if he's relaxed, but he just says he can't go. During the day when he's at our house with his grandma or on weekends, he'll do the same thing. You can tell when he's starting to go, but he won't go to the potty by himself like he does when he has to pee. Um, And let's see, we try to encourage with a special prize if he goes poop on the potty and tell him he can just tell us if he has to go. Last night after dinner, he pooped in his underwear and I put him on the potty. He said he couldn't go. And then I got him cleaned up, ready for a bath. While I was getting the bath ready, he started pooping again on the floor. I put him on the potty and he was able to go a tiny bit. And he, she says that that's the consistency of mud when he goes. Yeah, that's kind of classic, what we call incapricis or pseudo fecal incontinence. So the poop's falling out. They can't feel it. It's one thing I've learned is that you can't kind of reason through this stuff. 
the sensations you get that you respond to, they have to be felt and responded to to get the normal kind of response. And peeing is easy. As we say, pooping, pooping ain't easy. It's very hard. Kids do not like pooping. And what's happened to that child has gotten kind of backed up. And so there's so much of a backup now that it's falling out. But he's not getting that natural, like, urge response empty. That's too far gone. So there are a couple options for that child. And, and back to your original point, is he constipated? Yes. But the definition of constipation is kind of like the bane of my, you know, getting this message out because it means so many different things to so many different people. What I consider constipation kids is they're not pooping when they feel it, so they hold it in and it gets backed up. This is most assuredly contributing to his bedwetting as well, although it's harder to fix the bedwetting than it will be to fix the poop problems. And she's honestly very lucky he's not having a lot of pee problems during the day because most kids that have this problem can't control their pee during the day. There's a couple options for these kids, and I'll say that it's very normal. Uh, yeah, it's not normal. It's very common because it's such a typical behavior in children to have this problem at a young age in terms of not wanting to go poop and holding it and losing sensation. So a lot, a lot of people can relate to it. But you can either just empty him on your own time with enemas. We do a lot of that. And it, I've gotten so used to saying enemas, I probably should not just spurt it out like that because it's probably a shock <laughs> to most people. But it's, it's the easiest way to get, you know, poop that's sitting there out, right? It's positive enemas. So you could do these enemas daily, get that backed up poop out, and eventually he'd stop having poop accidents. And if you continued that process until you shrunk the colon down to how it was when he was born, then you'd stop bedwetting. But that may not be a goal in a such a child so young. So you could do that, get the poop accidents away, but then when you taper off the enemas, he may or may not poop on the potty, just because he may still have a little bit of immaturity in that behavior. And when he gets the urge to poop, in a setting outside of the enema or expository, he may just clench his sphincter and hold it in and the process can happen over again. So that's one option, uh, but we, we never know how they're going to respond when they get off of them. Another option is to kind of force the issue. And this is a, a method developed by Dr. Dom, who passed away, un unfortunately, a few years ago. But it's really smart because what he found out is that the urge to poop is kind of a subtle urge. You know, think about it. Like, I got to go, but it's not like, unless you have diarrhea or something, it's not like overwhelming. But the urge to pee kind of rises pretty quickly because the bladder is only so big. And so it kind of forces you to go to the bathroom. If you need to poop, you can squeeze your sphincter and the urge will go away pretty easily. And so kids can do that. They get really good at that. And so he found out that if you can make the urge really high, then it makes them go. And so he would use high dose X-lax or, or Senna. Combined with a couple of other tricks, he would keep them near the toilet when it was going to take effect, and he would keep them bottoms off. And so if you take the barriers of clothes as kind of like a safety net and um, the toilet being nearby, and you get this strong urge, these kids just poop on the potty. And it seems to flip a switch in their brain where when they get this urge, they'll go because the urge is coming so strongly. And then once they're trained in that method, you can kind of take away the, the high stimulus and go back to a normal stimulus. Right. It kind of it j jumps starts their brain to notice the connection because yeah, it's so strong. Exactly. Yeah. And it works great. And then, you know, later on when you're mature enough. So I, I've seen like in the kids that I, that I get backed up early because he's a little late in the game if he's already got poop falling out. But in kids that get backed up early, like you see hard poops or delayed poops, you can just kind of increase it with maybe some osmotic laxatives like Miralax or something. And not only do they no notice the stimulus and response, but they notice the that when they poop, it doesn't hurt. So you take away this negative connotation or negative association with pooping and they do great. But if you stop that too soon, it happens all over again. So I would, if I had kids on Miralax, for example, I would start it like at six months or one or two, and then they'd stay on it until five or six. So they're old enough to say, okay, if you have to poop, you know, you got to go. And they can talk back to you and say it was hard or soft because if you stop it too soon, they, it just comes back and some parents would really get nervous that their child was somehow addicted to Miralax or something. It's just a, not, it had nothing to do with the drug. It just had everything to do with their personality and their propensity to withhold poop. Is it dangerous to take something like Miralax long term? Because I've heard, I've heard that it is, but it sounds like you're suggesting it might not be. So all osmotic laxatives are just things that stay in the colon to draw water in, which are ideally suited for kids because 
the longer you hold poop in, the more water that gets drawn out. So it's going to, no matter how, they, how long they hold it, it's going to stay mushy. So by that fact and the fact that they stay within the colon or excrete completely within the colon, they should be safe. I treat Miralax like I treat peanuts. If you take it and you have a bad reaction, then don't take it. But I don't consider them poison. So if you take Miralax, you, most kids will do fine. But obviously, if you have a reaction, then don't take it. There are other osmotics like lactulose and magnesium products. Those are actually harder to take. Um, I had my own children on Miralax for years. They did fine. Um, it's, it seems like a cop-out, you know, because you're like, well, I want to increase their fiber or make a meat. It's just, it's almost, it's, it's nigh impossible with some kids to get the poop soft enough with normal methods to keep them pooping. It's, it's very difficult. Yeah. And the, like the repercussions are quite serious in terms of like c- kids who get constipated and then it moves into the end caprices and then they're at school and having poop accidents and the shame and all of that stuff. So it sounds like it would be a good trade-off. Yeah. And I, you know, I noticed a lot of, I think back to my own childhood where I kind of held my poop, you know, I was, I was in or or whatever. And then my kids where I treated it quickly and, er- and chronically, they just never really got hangups for pooping and when they were young. And they never, you know, it wasn't a big deal to them because it was always easy. And so I thought that was a little added benefit. Yeah, totally. So why, why do so, because what I've heard from clients when I hear things like this and I say, you should get, you know, get checked for constipation and they're, Doctors say, oh, no, if they're pooping every day, they're not constipated. But as you saw, as you said, in this case study, it was just kind of falling out, which is different than pooping. Why do you think that this is missed and misunderstood so much, the, the poop accidents and pee accidents? Yeah, I, I do not know. It's, it's funny. I had a case from Singapore yesterday where the child was having only urinary frequency, and so the no one would have even addressed that in the United States, let alone Singapore, except this mom had read my book. So she said, well, can we get an x-ray? And so the doctor got the x-ray and was like blown away at how much poop was in there. Like the doctor would never predict it. And, and then the funny part of it was the doctor's like, well, we're going to get this cleaned out here. You're going to need to do at least two enemas. And I'm like, yeah, more like 200 enemas, you know, not I'm being facetious, but the, the, the people aren't looking for the poop because they're thinking, you know, if you're pooping okay every day, it's probably normal. Or they'll say, okay, I agree they're backed up. Here's a couple of enemas. Now you're empty. We, we've, we've done so many kids and followed up on so many. We know it takes a lot of work. And it, it defies logic sometimes because I've had kids, you know, do uh, uh, impressive amount of cleanouts, whether orally or rectally, and not get better. And I'm like, well, if you're not better, let's check the x-ray. And the x-ray does not look that much better. And, and sometimes it's just you got to – just trust the process and work through the goals and, and then they can get better. But I think that's the main thing is that the symptoms don't match the present, the, the problem, like they're coming in with a bedwetting. What's poop have to do with it? You know, this kid's pooped their whole lives are fine. Picking this up is very subtle. And then even doctors that agree bedwetting is caused by constipation don't aggressively look for it like we do. And if they find it, they don't treat it to its logical extent. So it's just a matter of believing it. I guess some people may not may not be big believers, but it's I've seen it work. Yeah. Well, they should rush to your website and yeah, get yeah. all the, the things that you to provide on there. I also have heard from clients that they they're told it's psychological, right? That the, the you know that that they get into believing that the kid's pooping their pants on purpose, like that their doctor or somebody's told them that that they're you know they're sending a me- some sort of message or something. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because I always say to my clients, nobody wants to poop their pants, which yeah, a, I think I might have heard you say before. Big agreement with you on that. You know, think, think of if we go back to the process of pooping in easy anyway, like to poop in your pants is going to take some, you know, it's going to be like a, you have to volitionally like squat down. And now some kids hide to poop when they're in diapers. That's very common, but it is associated with constipation. So this kind of behavior might get misread as like, oh, they're just, you know, just aware they're pooping. But if you're, if this kid's, the kind of kids I like, the way I like to see kids poop in pull-ups is just because they're playing, stop, poop, keep playing, right? It's not even in their brain. It's just a minor. If they're hiding in a corner, say, don't look at me, squatting down, then that's the sign of holding. But to to speak to the axis after training, I, I think it's a very slippery slope and a dangerous kind of logic to blame kids because Maybe there is one kid out there that poops on purpose, but it is really rare. The vast majority of these kids, when you get them cleaned out and fix the system, they poop, poop and pee fine. 
And there are so many kids that are abused because of incontinence. I mean, to propagate that kind of misconception really does a disservice to the parents and the child. So I really like to agree with you and, and join you in screaming from the mountaintops that accents aren't kids' faults. And they're not even a phase that, you know, it's worth watching. I mean, if you have a kid that's three and a half, four out of diapers and they're having accents, I don't see any use in just waiting until they get mature or whatever. Just treat the problem and they'll, they'll, everyone will be better off. And another thing I like to add is, you know, there are a couple of rare cases where it's not even they're just withholding. Some kids have missed real problems like tethered spinal cord or a missed, missed an anatomical variant that if you at least get the process started and worked up, you can pick up early as, as opposed to late. And, and so can you speak a little bit to the, you were talking about the diagnosis of the x-ray. Can you speak a little bit about that? Like if, if there is a parent who's, because this is another thing I've heard. I actually have, I've talked about you a lot. You have no idea. Thank but you. another thing I've heard is that I'll say to parents, I think you should look at constipation and they'll come back and they'll say, oh, our doctor said that, that they're not constipated because they felt around their abdomen. I hear or, that a lot, yeah. Yeah, and so I say you have to insist on an x-ray, a la Dr. Hodges. Can you speak a little bit to that, the diagnosis of constipation or incapricis? Yeah, I'll add to that, that not only do you need an x-ray, but you have to have someone read it that knows what they're looking for too, because I've had a lot of what you said where the doctors say, well, you know, or do you poop every day? Tell me it feels fine. They're not constipated. Or I've had x-rays ordered. And radiology say normal stool pattern or gas pattern, you know, normal x-ray. And they're like, see, it was normal. And so what happened is I did, I, I took a course at the beginning of my career at Cincinnati where they had a very prominent bowel management program for kids with imperfect anus and cloacal malformations. And they were, these kids had, don't have an anal sphincter, so they cannot be continent of, of poop. And so their, their treatment for that is just basically to flush them out every day with an enema that empties them completely so that they're dry until the next day where they do another enema. And the way they track their emptying is with x-rays. So when I was having trouble treating these kids, I serendipitously went to this conference and came back and said, you know what, I'm going to get x-rays. Why not? We have a machine down the hall. And I remember our first kid was a bedwetter. I go, you poop okay? And mom's like, hey, poop's fine. Let's just get an x-ray. Get the x-ray and he's full of poop. And we typically see poop in one of two patterns. One is which the entire colon is just full of poop, which is obviously abnormal. The second is the end of the colon, the rectum, where they hold, you know, they're, where they're withholding is full and dilated. And that's what causes the bladder problems. And the second place was the right colon. So like the, the colon goes up like a question mark down. And it's interesting that we've seen that very consistently, that if you start holding poop, it piles up in the rectum, but it doesn't pile up linearly backwards piles up there first and the second place to pile up is when it's going against gravity on the right colon because this must disturb the peristalsis of the colon and so forth. So yeah, I think, you know, maybe five percent of the parents come in thinking their kids are backed up. But if you get the x-ray and you look for rectal dilation, I mean honestly I, I, I know it's there nowadays, so I, I get it more for the parents, but it's very useful to diagnose and, and I do use it to follow treatment. If they're not getting better and they're doing a lot of enemas, I'll like, well let's see if you're getting empty. Because I like to tell people, you know, it doesn't matter how many enemas you do or how much Miralax you take. If you haven't gotten empty, you're not going to get better. It's just kind of a tool. So if they're not getting better, we check and see. And typically they aren't as empty as they thought they were. Yeah. And I think what I've read on your site is that sometimes kids can have, and I, I realize that I should have introduced this idea earlier of how you could poop every day and still be constipated is that there can be like a mass of poop in there. And then the other poop can get past the mass, right? Or, or, or do there's so much in there that's very true is, is what was why you can have loose poop, you know, or, or you just have so much in there, maybe some hard, hot, soft, and you just kind of let a little bit out every day, right? Instead of getting one big evacuation, you're, you're, you're getting, you're, you're maximally stretched and then you stretch a little bit more, you feel like you got to poop and you just get a little bit less out. Right. In medicine, you know, there's lots of muscles that we know work well at a certain degree of stretch, but then stop working well if they're overstretched. And I think that's what happens to the rectum as well. Right. And so I just wanted to like clarify that, that what we typically think of constipation is no poop coming out at all, but that this, this is like, you can be constipated, but still having poop come out because of all of the, the biomechanics that you just talked about. L literally, I think what's holding this whole field back is, is semantics. Um, Dr. O'Regan, who was the first to discover this, when I told him like these kids, you know, 
they're constipated. He goes, what they have, Steve, is an inability to completely empty the rectum, a failure to completely empty the and I, and I was like, well, that's, that's the best way to put it. Smart yeah. guy, obviously. Yeah. It needs to be a new word, I guess. Yeah, I know. It just doesn't, yeah. it's hard yeah. to say. Yeah. So, so you mentioned before when you were talking about, you know, that kids shouldn't be, that this should not be seen as a behavior problem, which I just, I just want to really reiterate that because I have seen kids punished. You know, you have to wash your underwear. Uh, um, yeah. And, you know, very well meaning parents who think, well, if I can make this unpleasant for them, then they'll, then they'll try harder or whatever. But I just really want to highlight that it's not, no amount of underwear washing or cleaning up the poop is going to make a kid's biology, you know, the problems with what it's happening change. So I just wanted to just reiterate that for anyone listening, but also can you speak to the myth of that they'll grow out of it? Yeah. So there, I'll, I'll say that will kids eventually outgrow of pee, outgrow pee and poop accidents? Yes, eventually, but it can take years, if not decades. And so no one can tell you when they're going to outgrow it. So I see no reason to, you know, I don't see that as a good reason to treat it because for various reasons. Number one, a dilated, chronically full colon is not healthy, probably leads to IBS later. This is speculation, but it makes sense. Bedwetting is disruptive to sleep and, and, and restorative sleeping kids. So the sooner you treat it, the better they'll sleep. Because imagine if you, if you had encopresis and enuresis your whole childhood, and then you grew up and you had ADHD and all this stuff from and poor school performance, maybe because you never really slept at night. Plus you had IBS because your colon was stretched. I mean, those are all preventable. I mean, I make an extreme example, but just because it might get better doesn't mean you can't fix it a lot sooner and, and restore kind of normal physiology to these kids. That makes a lot of sense. I, one of my kids actually, and I actually don't think he was constipated, but one of my kids was still wetting the bed at eight. And our doctor said the same thing. He'll grow out of it. But what we realized, and we fixed it within a week, which is why I think that he wasn't constipated, which is he didn't like the smell of the bathrooms at school and he wasn't going at all during the day. So we we bribed him with, if you start going to the bathroom at school, we'll buy you this $100 Lego kit. And within like 10 days, he had he had, had a week of, of dry nights and because he, he was actually going during Empty the day. Empty on time. Yeah, yeah. so that... You get in the gray area there where like if you if if, if someone has uh, really puts puts her feet to the fire and said, you know, is it behavioral? Well holding delaying pooping is behavioral, of course. But that's they don't know what they're doing. But once you delay pooping long enough that you have this full overflow and poop's falling out, then it's not behavioral because you can't control it. Right. The process yeah. the behavior is early on and if you can pick that up and, and influence it like you did, then you can save yourself some trouble. Yeah, well, and it just cost a hundred bucks, so it was yeah, yeah, and that's why a lot, you know, a lot of these are infant reflexes, like the bladder accents, that why they get better. But a lot of those have get better because eventually you just start pooping on time, right? Because you're old enough that it makes no sense not mm -hmm. to. Yeah, mm -hmm. some people might not, but well, this is a good segue to toilet training because I think what happened was he was a very early self toilet trainer, like 21 months. He started mm -hmm. like I was not like no pressure. He just wanted to use the toilet. But I think what happened was he was holding his pee during the day because he wanted to keep playing. And then he he just never transitioned to dry at night until we kind of went, okay, he's not outgrowing this. But maybe you could talk a little bit about toilet training or toilet learning best practices, because it sounds like that's where kind of a lot of this might have its origins. Yeah, I think toilet training is one of those things where if you just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. There, it's very possible to train children very young if you wanted to. And, and I, I do have empathy for families that, you know, where diapers are maybe an, an expense they can't afford. And, and that's, we should find better, simple, you know, solutions to that than early training. But it, let's say you have a child that you trained at some, you know, I've seen kids trained at 12 months or something like that. Okay. They've learned, what do they learn? They learn to hold in the pee and the poop, but they haven't learned anything about it's important to go when you feel it, you know, and they, and they don't even have any concept, even three year olds. It's kind of a fuzzy concept. So first rule is don't ru rush it. I, I, I've, I've become less dogmatic because I know everyone's different. And honestly, if you don't have genetics that make your colon and bladder respond to withholding, you, you may be fine, even if, you, if your kid does withhold. But broadly speaking for the population, it's better to train later so they don't hold. And it's usually about between three and three and a half is when kids are able to kind of understand the concepts. So slowly introduce it at that age. And number two is make sure they're pooping like clockwork beforehand, because if they're, if they've gotten backed up or having trouble pooping, 
the process will be much more difficult. If you have the colon set up and working w- well, they'll probably pee on the toilet, no, no problem. Maybe it takes a little bit of effort to convince them to poop on the potty, kind of like your first case, but uh, there's a lots of tricks for that. But the idea is you get them trained, in- introduce it at an age where they understand that, oh, it is important to go. You can explain that. And you're keeping the poop soft, so they have no reason to hold. And it's a lot easier. The problem we see is that kids, if they train early or if they train even late and the parents are just like, I'm done, you're on your own. We talk about in the book, you know, what other activity do you leave? And we can talk about toilet avoidance if you want for pooping because that's pretty common, you know, in kids. Yeah, I was going to ask you why don't kids, you said earlier that nobody likes to, that kids don't like to poop. Why is that? It's just very stimulating, right? It's It's more uncomfortable. Peeing is like almost relief. You do it. It's a liquid. It doesn't hurt to pass. Pooping, if the if the uh, if the texture, how hard or soft it is or whatever, is off a little bit. I think it probably comes from, you know, how much fiber were humans eating 10,000 years ago? I don't know. Probably a lot. And so the we, we don't get nearly that much fiber. And I'm not, I'm not saying fiber is a cure-all, but if you had a diet that was high in fiber and... Um, raw fruits and vegetables like people used to eat it's it's definitely lubricated a lot more you feel a lot less if you you take fiber supplement now you get the same sensation so since we're so far removed from that the sensations we get aren't comfortable and so as a little kid the first thing to do is fear avoidance or pain avoidance just to clench your sphincter and so you develop this cycle pretty quickly and then the the flip side of keeping them on pull-ups because when i first started i was like well let's just I only saw, you know, bad things when kids were trained. So let's just keep them untrained for as long as possible. Then you get these four-year-olds who are like, I'm not pooping on the potty. I like my pull-up. And so you have to kind of train them back to the toilet. But that's a lot easier than fixing incontinence or incapricis. Right. Do you have any tips? I actually have quite a few people who have talked about their kids' resistance to letting go of the pull-ups. Do you have any any tips for that? For pooping on the potty? Yeah. Yeah, there's two ways. Uh, both of them work great. And the first is from the book. Both of them, I'll, I'll credit people that gave them to me because I didn't come up with them on my own. It's the, I think it's Ins and Outs of Poop. It's a book and it's the slow transition to pooping. It's got a great bit in there. It's like two paragraphs or, or a couple of pages. Here's it all. You basically get them on mirror lax or, or similar and you have them poop in the pull up. And once they're doing that easily, you know, the poop is coming out. So like I mentioned earlier, like not even a second thought. Then you say, okay, you can put, you put it in the pull up, but you're going to have to do it in the bathroom and you can see where this is going. Then it's like near the toilet on the toilet and he talks about in the book that some kids won't sit on the toilet without the pull-up and so he got to the point where he was cutting out holes in the pull-ups and this one family it's famous from that book is the the kid hadn't soiled the pull-up in weeks and they didn't want to buy a new box of diapers so they just kept the one with a hole in it and she would put it on and it got to the point where it's like a torn belt to the put on and but she wouldn't poop without it and just shows you how much this gets in the brain of these kids yeah. And so once you do that, you can do that. And I, I did a similar experience with one of my kids and it worked fine. And the other is the Dom method I mentioned earlier, where you just kind of like, we're going to hang out in the bathroom, no bottoms next to the toilet. And we're going to take six X lax squares and we'll hang out here and play, play with the iPad until it hits you. And, and when it hits those kids, they're flip, they just, where do I go? Toilet's right there. And, and it flips switch from, like you said, in the brain. So one's right. a kind of sink or swim. The other is kind of a gradual. But right. it both of them work well. Yeah. We, in peaceful parenting, we sometimes talk about that fear associated with poop and talk about getting kids laughing about poop, like potty jokes and poop humor, and just to help them release some of the tension that they feel around feeling resistant around around going poop. Yeah. I wish I knew more about pe- uh, pediatric psychology. I probably could have some other ideas, but I'm just kind of saying what I, because I've seen, I've seen lots of different videos and books just talking about it. You wouldn't think would work, but it kind of gets them thinking. And that's obviously a lot easier to do than some of the te- techniques we use. Well, at least start with that. Whenever, whenever I have clients who are in Toronto where I live, there's a place called the Poop Cafe. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but no. it's, I think it's Japanese inspired Uh and you go and they've like, I've never been, but they have like ice cream sundaes and little mini toilets that are like chocolate ice cream Uh, and like everything they serve is poop themed. And you would not think that would be successful. (laughs) It's it's a huge success. That's That's crazy. crazy. Yeah. Hilarious. And I think, you know, I think the timing thing you were mentioning that you mentioned before, you know, diapers are expensive. And also there's so much pressure these days from schools that kids have to be out of diapers before they start, you know, before they 
start go into the preschool room or something like that. So I think that's also hard on families. Yeah, I think, you know, parents, everyone likes to think, you know, you're well with their kids and early potty training is sometimes one as a badge of honor. Like, look how smart my kid is. They, they don't like being dirty or whatever. So I like to semi-joking, but flip it on its head. Like, no, no, you're like, lower animals have no problems being and pooping. It's smarter, smarter mammals that have trouble. And being anal retentive is a, you know, sign of organization. So maybe the smarter <laughs> kids are having trouble. Oh, that's funny. Okay, final final question, because this comes up also a lot. I'm using you for professional development. I hope you don't mind. No, um, I was just talking to a client this week who has a five-year-old who is really, really, really strong-willed. And this happens a lot, too, where the kids resist being bossed around and they don't want to go pee even if they're dancing around. And I know sometimes it can be like an interoception that they haven't made the connection between having to go and knowing they have to go. But in this particular case, she just has, was having a lot of power struggles with her kid about trying to get her to go pee when she woke up in the morning or before they got in the car. And after working with me some and, and dropping the power struggles, she's worried now that her child doesn't go enough. So how, in my sense was that it actually is pretty like harmful and unhealthy to only go pee twice a day. Is that, is that true? It depends. And so is this child having holding behavior now or is it just like, I don't have to pee until I pee and then I pee fine? Yeah. So she, her mom says that she will wake up in the morning, not having peed since like six o'clock the night before. She'll wake up, says she doesn't have to go, goes to school. I said, maybe she's peeing at school. She said the teacher doesn't think she is. And then she won't go again until she gets home from school. And so she's going like only twice a day, no accidents, no other signs of, you know, no dancing around. But seemingly only has to go twice a day and the mom's worried about it so when i discuss this i can totally see people that don't believe my theory of saying like this guy blames this for everything but there is data there is animal data and human data and this is a, there's a genetic variation that if you put a like if you're going to mimic constipation you put a balloon in, in a rectum and inflate it so you're stretching out the rectum there's three responses to the bladder to that one is what we typically talk about, which is overactivity. So uninhibited bladder contractions, daytime wetting, bed wetting, frequency, urgency, and, the, and that's the one that most everyone sees a doctor. About a third of the kids get that. About a third of the people get no change in bladder function. No one knows why. They just do great. And so there's kids that might come to my clinic with encapresis, poop accents, or they're so full of poop, but their bladder's fine. And go figure, right? I mean, I, no one knows why that is. A third of them do get bladder underactivity. So it's like non-PC word, but it's like called lazy bladder syndrome still. They may have changed the word by now. That was when I learned about it. And so if you have a kid that pees rarely, I mean, you don't have to get an x-ray, but if you want to know, she can get an x-ray and it probably is full. And if you treat it, you get more sensation. It's really hard to make, going back to like, you can't reason through this stuff. You have to get the urge and respond to it. You can't say, go pee. Um, and a kid goes and pees, right? I mean, adults can do that well, like before a trip, I'm going to go empty my bladder, but they're not, they don't have the control and, and, and they need the urge to go. And so I would say, you know, make sure she's pooping well, but if she's not having accents and not having UTIs, then it's probably fine. A lot of kids that come in related kind of, but different is cerebral palsy kids. Cause they have a brain injury. They never really potty train. They, they, they pee with an infant pattern. And so it's just a reflex, reflex. And so over time, the blood gets bigger and bigger. So they'll come into my office peeing once a day, a liter of urine. And I, I make sure that I get an ultrasound, make sure the kidneys aren't swollen, but almost always the bladder is compliant and they do fine. So not to blame everything on constipation, but I think my point would be to make sure she's pooping well and then don't push it because you're going to lose anyway. But if she starts having a problem, you know, you can investigate because the issues that you can get just from the time is maybe UTI because urine is in there so long. But I would be love to see like that x-ray in it. And, but we have seen several cases of this lazy bladder syndrome resolved with that by just making the poop normal and then they, they start peeing okay. Yeah, that's so good to know because I didn't even think about constipation because it didn't fit into the other patterns yeah. that I was more familiar with. And, it, and to your previous point, like when they're every time, you know, if I had a nickel for every time I saw, you know, parents said, well, they don't go pee until the last minute and then, or they'll potty, they'll do a potty dance or they'll curtsy or squat. And then the urge goes away and I ask them to go pee and they say, well, I don't have to pee anymore. That's very common because what's happening there is instead of getting the gradual urge to pee that we get, 
they get nothing to a million, zero to a hundred. And if they move, it's like they're going to wet. So they have to squat and hold it. And then that in contraction went away. And so now they really don't have to pee. So trying to pee on a schedule or trying to get them to go to the bathroom after that is kind of a mugs game. You never win. What's better is just to fix the bowel so they get normal sensation, just like a dog or a cat or a bear gets. And they don't have to think about it. And they just go pee. So just advice on that tip point as well. Oh, that's really good to know. Thank you so much. This has been super helpful. And uh, I know it's going to help a lot of parents and a lot of kids, quite frankly, who are, you know, sort of getting accused of not trying hard enough or doing it on purpose. And it just always makes me sad. So thank yeah, you. Thank you sad. for all of that. Yeah. Thank you. Final final question of a question I ask all my guests, which has nothing to do. I mean, I guess your answer could have to do with pooping, but I, I sort of doubt it will. But if you could go back in time to your younger parent self, what advice would you give yourself knowing what you know now? Make them learn another language to the young age. <laughs> what language would you, how old are your kids now? 17, 15, 13 this year. Okay. What language would you have? I, I, sp I speak Greek and my wife does not. And so it's just in the hustle and bustle of life. I never really took the time to teach them. And then they couldn't go to Greek school because they had dance. And so, I mean, nowadays the uh, with Duolingo and stuff, they're, they're doing it pretty well. And honestly, the AI is so good. Maybe you don't need to know another language, but I still wish they could, uh, could read it and speak it like I do. Have you taken them to Greece? Yeah, we had a great time. Yeah. We want to go yeah. back. Just haven't been back since we went in 2018. Nice. Awesome, well, yeah. that's a, that's a good impetus to want to learn the languages if you like the place and ah, the everyone speaks English is a problem. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. so easy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Where's the best place to go for um, people to find out find oh, yes, your resources? You. Our website. Everything's there. www.bedwettingandaccidents.com. Links to all our research, all our books. Contacting me, our Facebook page, our blog, our podcast appearances. Everything's there. That reminds me, is, and I think you had this at one point, but I haven't looked. Do you have a list of practitioners for people who don't live in your, who don't live near you? Yeah, we have um, some folks that are kind of on board with the system and they, they're, they're definitely around and on the webpage for sure. Great. And that's there too. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. I hope you found this conversation insightful and exactly what you needed in this moment. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Remember that I'm rooting for you. I see you out there showing up for your kids and doing the best you can. Sending hugs over the airwaves today. Hang in there. You've got this.